Hello and welcome everybody to the statutory public meeting for 362 and 398 North Service Road. Um, this is the official plan amendment zoning bylaw amendment and draft plan of subdivision uh, public meeting. Um, we're going to go through a, what will end up happening is there'll be a presentation by staff, a brief one on what this process looks like. Then there'll be a presentation from the um, applicant and then there'll be a full question and answer period following. Um, I would, we're just want to, I'm going to be, because we've started commencing already, I'm going to read just this, this little piece about live streaming because this is one of our first meetings, uh, public meetings that we're actually live streaming and I want to make sure that everyone in the audience is comfortable with it. So uh, members of the public are advised that our meetings are streamed live by the town of Grimsby. Individuals and media may be audibly and are visually recorded during this meeting as well a reminder all electronic devices are to be in silent mode during our council meeting. So if anyone's not, not comfortable with that, um, you know, please feel free to uh, share your comments in another way or, or uh, you're welcome to not stay if you're not comfortable. But this is our first one. So you can go back and watch yourself a hundred times on the um, archive on the town's website following this meeting and, and what you, are, you can listen to what you, what you said. Um, so I think I'm not reading that. I wasn't, wasn't going to read it till we start with that. I can read it now if you'd like. That's a good idea. Okay. So the second uh, comment I'm going to read, um, I'll go through all the rules and stuff here, is this is a statutory public meeting. So um, we are uh, under the Planning Act Section 34, 14.5 required to make this statement. Uh, if a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting, or make written submissions to the Town of Grimsby in respect of the proposed applications before the approval authority gives or refuses to give approval to the applications, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of the Town of Grimsby to the Local Planning Appeal Tribunal. If a person or public body does not make oral submissions at a public meeting or make written submissions to the Town of Grimsby in respect of the proposed applications before the approval authority gives or refuses to give approval to the applications, the person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal in the opinion of the tri if in the opinion of the, of the tribunal there are reasonable grounds to do so. The other thing I would just ask is, um, as this is a, a lot of people will have varying opinions on this application, and I would ask that we maintain decorum um, during the meeting. Um, try to refrain from any um, outbursts, uh, et cetera, um, but please feel free to share. Everyone is in a respectful environment, and we need to share and appreciate that everyone may have different opinions. Um, respect those. Um, if you can, and um, I will call, I will identify if there's any issues that come out of that. But please, uh, I would just ask that um, everyone be patient, every, give everyone an opportunity to speak. There will be a question and answer period following the presentation by Ms. Shanks and the applicant. Um, the public will be invited to come up to the podium where Ms. Shanks is standing over here, um, and you'll have 10 minutes to make, uh, to make your comments or questions uh, to the applicant or to the planning staff. Um, I would ask that if you hear someone else making a similar comment or question that, you know, perhaps if it's been addressed, you'll, you'll hear that answer already and you might have a different question to ask so that we can allow um, an opportunity for everyone to have um, their questions and answers brought forward to the podium. If you're not able to, I believe there's comment sheets and uh, comment and question forms uh, available. If they weren't put out in the, uh, in the open lobby area, um, I'm sure that the staff will make some available for you. If you're not comfortable with coming up to speak at the podium, we are really, really interested in hearing what your comments and questions are. So please, uh, we'll make those available to you or you can send an email to planning at grimsby.ca or speak to any of your ward councillors, send them an email. So there's lots of opportunities um, for feedback from this meeting uh, if you're not comfortable at tonight's um, uh, statutory public meeting to come up and speak. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Shanks to do the presentation from planning staff, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Planning and Development Committee and everyone who's come out tonight. As was noted, my name is Amy Shanks and I'm a senior planner with the Town of Grimsby. So the agenda for tonight's meeting is shown on the slide. I'll provide a general overview of the planning process, what a public meeting is, and some general information about the proposed applications that are the subject of tonight's meeting. The applicant will then follow up with their own presentation about the applications, and then we'll open the floor up to public questions and comments. 
So tonight's meeting is a statutory public meeting for these applications. A statutory public meeting is required to be held under the Planning Act for all applications to amend the official plan or zoning bylaw and for a draft plan of subdivision. Verbal comments received tonight will become part of the application record and members of the public who make verbal comments at tonight's meetings will have right to appeal the official plan amendment and the zoning bylaw amendment under the Planning Act. So before we get too far into the details, it's important I discuss why plans change through applications, such as the ones being considered tonight. In general, the Planning Act gives authority to individuals to submit applications for development proposals that do not meet the current official plan policies or the zoning bylaw regulations. The town is required under the Planning Act to process these applications. Official plans may only be amended if the change complies with the overall intent of the official plan and is consistent with provincial and regional policy. Zoning bylaws may be amended if the change is compatible with the official plan and surrounding neighborhoods and is consistent with regional and provincial policy. So the slide above shows the planning process. As noted previously, we are currently at the public meeting stage of the application process for these applications. An open house for these applications was held already on February 12th, 2019. Preceding this meeting, staff will begin to formulate a staff recommendation report that we presented at a later meeting. Following this, council will be in a position to make a decision to either approve, approve with conditions or modifications, or deny the applications. If you don't wish, wish to speak tonight, you are still able to submit comments in writing regarding the applications up until council makes a decision. To submit written comments, please email us at planning at grimsby.ca. We also ask that you copy your ward counselor to your email so that they are made aware of your comments. So I'm now gonna briefly outline the proposed applications. Um, as shown on the slide, the subject lands for these applications are the former truck wheel, uh, fifth wheel truck stop on the North Service Road. The slide above shows the current development plan for the site. The proposed development consists of six mixed-use apartment buildings comprised of a total of 1,276 units and 6,984 square meters of commercial and employment space on the ground floor fronting the North Service Road. These buildings are proposed to have heights of 18, 22, 12, 12, 14, and 14 stories. Also proposed is 36 two and a half story townhouse units, approximately 0.896 hectares of parkland area that is proposed to be dedicated to the town for the extension of the West End Waterfront Trail, and a total of 2,099 parking spaces are proposed on site. So since the open house meeting, the applicant has made changes to the proposed development plan to address comments received. A summary of some of the key changes are shown on the slide above. This list is not exclusive to all the changes, but it's intended to show the most significant ones that have occurred. Notably, um, 1,276 residential units are now proposed. Previously, this was 1,247 units. Building E has been increased to 14 stories. Previously, it was 10 stories. Uh, there are now 36 two and a half story townhouse units proposed, whereas at the open house, it was 38 two and a half story townhouse units. Um, there was three story back to back townhouse units shown on the previous plan. These townhouse units have been removed. Uh, in regards to the park land, uh, there are new open space blocks proposed to separate hazard lands and natural heritage buffers from the proposed parkland blocks. Previously, these lands were all incorporated together, so the parkland area that was being proposed as part of the draft plan of subdivision uh, appeared to be larger than what it is currently. And um, finally, there are now 6,984 square meters of commercial employment space on the ground floor of the mixed-use buildings with 4,655 square meters exclusively devoted to employment uses. Previously, it was just 5,334 square meters of commercial employment space proposed. So the applications have separated those two um, uses out from one another and provided some more floor space. 
So in the town's official plan, the subject lands are designated um, a variety of designations. These are shown on the slide. Um, they are designated mixed use high density and that's indicated by the red areas on the map. Employment overlay, which is the blue hatched areas on the map. Parks and open space, which is the lighter green color along the waterfront. Environmental conservation area, which is the dark green area running through the middle, as well as streams, which is the blue line through the dark green area. And finally, the hazard land area, which is the black hatched area on the slide. So the official plan amendment application proposes to increase the maximum permitted height on the subject lands from 12 stories to 22 stories and reduce the extent of the employment overlay by approximately half. In regards to the zoning application, uh, the subject lands are currently zoned neighborhood development, private open space, and a hazard land overlay in the town zoning bylaw. The zoning amendment application proposes to allow for a change in the zoning to a mixed use high density and public open space zone, modify the performance standards for setbacks and maximum height, specific commercial uses and a minimum employment floor area of 46,000 square feet to implement OP policies, and the requested parking production that was presented at the open house meeting has been removed from the application as the applicant has indicated that they will comply with what is permitted for parking under the zoning bylaw. As I noted earlier, a draft plan of subdivision is proposed for the subject lands. This is shown on the slide and will create nine blocks and one public road. In other words, it will create the lot fabric for the proposed development. So as with every planning application, staff circulated these applications to external agencies and internal departments for their review and comment. At the time of the information report was prepared for this meeting, um, staff had not yet received final comments from Niagara Region or the MPCA. Both agencies indicated they required more information prior to finalizing their comments. Uh, this afternoon, staff received finalized comments from Niagara Region, indicating that they are supportive of the applications from a provincial and regional policy perspective and offer no objections to the applications, subject to certain draft plan conditions being satisfied and a holding symbol being placed on the portions of the land that required a detailed noise study and the filing of a record of site condition. Staff have not yet received final comments from the MBCA. The Ministry of Transportation requested draft plan conditions and provided transportation impact study review comments. Town's public work staff also provided their own transportation impact study review comments. Town parks, recreation and culture staff noted that the parkland dedication is reasonably consistent with what is planned through the town's West End Waterfront Trail design study and master plan, and that the park area should be built prior to commencing residential construction. Enbridge Gas requested draft land conditions, and Hydro One indicated they had no comments. All these comments and any additional comments received from agencies will be formulated into staff's final recommendation report. Uh, town staff also retained SGL Planning and Design Inc. to review the applications from a planning and design perspective. In their comments, they noted that although the applicant has been working with staff to address many issues with the applications, there are a few key design and policy directions that need to be addressed further. Namely, the provision of defined podiums and smaller floor plates, a tower separation distance of at least 25 meters, greater than zero meter building setbacks from lot lines, improved treatment of the North Service Road, providing a landmark gateway building to the site, improved public connection, visibility to the waterfront through the site, parkland blocks must be fully unencumbered by natural heritage features, more fulsome urban design briefs submitted, and employment overlay policies in the official plan addressed through standalone commercial and office buildings, more employment forced place, employment delivered in first phase versus the second phase of the development, and explain how a high quality business environment along the North Service Road will be achieved by the development. So to conclude my presentation, I'm just gonna summarize what the next steps for this application will be. Uh, so next we will proceed to receive all public comments and updated agency comments concerning these applications and we'll prepare a staff recommendation report which incorporates these comments and staff's review of the application. And finally, for council to make a decision regarding these applications. I now have Mr. Dave Aston with MHBC Planning. He's here representing the applicant and will make a pre presentation concerning the application. Thank you.
Thanks, Amy, and uh, thank you, Chair and Committee, for the opportunity to be here uh, to present again this evening on this application uh, by Lozani Homes. With me this evening, we have our team, uh, Fred Lozani, Lorraine Roberts, Brandon Almeida, Stephanie Murdich, John McGinn, and Claudia Costa, so uh, representatives from Lozani Homes, MHBC, and Chamberlain Architects. So we're here to answer questions that may arise uh, as we've been working hard with staff uh, throughout. It's been almost a year now uh, since we were here last, so want to also thank staff uh, for their uh, always willingness to meet and engage in discussion and working uh, with us to resolve issues. The applications were outlined by uh, Ms. Shanks. This uh, image here provides you with a uh, uh, sense of the cross-section of the development uh, from the lake to the North Service Road and to give you some context of the design considerations with uh, the waterfront uh, lands interaction with the waterfront trail and design considerations from the lake to the service road and the transition of, of buildings and design to maintain you know, that uh, public realm, that feel from the waterfront trail uh, as a low rise rather than you know a wall of buildings um, right up against the waterfront trail or the op open space and public use lands. So the applications were outlined as to what's being proposed and uh, with the height associated with the official plan amendment uh, for the maximum height of 22 meters of one of the buildings and then uh, you'll see the other proposed changes there. So I don't intend to uh, reiterate uh, the overview by Ms. Shanks as it was very well done and detailed as to what's being proposed. As I mentioned, we were here for the neighborhood meeting almost a year ago, a resubmission of materials uh, based on the initial agency circulation and uh, various meetings with town and agency staff have occurred. As you can see there, we've listed a few of them. That doesn't include all of the phone calls and discussions. And the notice of the public meeting and the media meeting this evening. So we'll be taking the information from this evening and working with staff uh, moving forward to the staff recommendation. What I can say is we uh, have been following up uh, with uh, agency staff as well and uh, can advise that as we've been working through the redesign associated with the channel, which I'll speak to in a moment, uh, we've had a number of discussions with NPCA. It's our understanding that their comments uh, are forthcoming and in general the design that we've been working through addresses the concerns that were raised. So we're fairly confident that uh, those comments will also be addressed as we move forward. This slide gives some context to the overall waterfront and consideration of, of Casablanca Boulevard and really this node or major intensification area as identified in the official plan and a sense of the different approved and permitted heights within the area for proposed buildings. What I want to also point to is that these lands represent approximately 400 meters of the waterfront frontage uh, and opportunity for that amount for the waterfront trail. So a major contribution to the overall uh, waterfront trail within this context uh, of, of the area. This was the initial proposal. Um, uh, Ms. Shanks covered off the changes uh, and that was a good summary. This is a bit more of a summary and just wanted to walk through some of the changes. Uh, you'll see number one, that is the uh, channel. If you recall from the first meeting, the intent there was to have more of a closed bioswell system. And in working with the town and the region, the conservation authority, uh, we've moved to having that as an open channel that would also have uh, uh, side slopes, landscaped, and a multi-use trail in combination uh, with that. So it, that area has increased in size uh, for that channel, uh, naturalized, and also provides a larger view corridor through that area. Uh, number two, uh, the uh, open space was increased because of changes associated with that channel and other considerations uh, 
within addressing uh, agency comments. Number three, uh, you will see addition of a flex street to create an additional point uh, of access between the waterfront trail and a north-south connection through the site. So the idea there is uh, that connection would be made publicly available uh, through the future development of that area and serve as a north-south connection to uh, the trail uh, as discussions continue and the town and the region continue to look at the potential to extend the waterfront trail to the east. We wanted to make sure that that trail continued to have a connection point north-south and we'd work with the town on an interim solution to where that trail ended at the property limits and make sure there's appropriate design and signage in that area. That also led to the removal of the back-to-back -back townhouses that were internal to that block on number four and that also opened up that area for some green space and additional amenity area. Number five is reconfiguration of Winston Road. Through the comments received uh, from the town, there was discussion associated with providing a range of 40 to 50 parking spaces along Winston Road that would be accessible for the public to then access the waterfront. So we looked at the redesign of Winston Road there and provided uh, 51 parking spaces that would be available um, to the public for use by the public to access. Uh, the waterfront trail. The internal laneway was adjusted, uh, number, number one, that extends really along and, and mirroring the North Service Road. Um, and that was adjusted based on comments received from uh, public works staff uh, and to address setback requirements from the MTO. In that area, there's approximately 80 parking spaces. And again, recall we had some discussion on the parking uh, at the last meeting, uh, Ms. Shanks advised that the application has been revised to uh, remove the request to reduce the parking requirement, uh, although continuing to comply with the approach that the town has to calculate shared parking spaces and uh, the peak requirements for parking. All of that to say that those 80 spaces uh, remain on the site but are not included in that calculation. Uh, so there are additional 80 available spaces uh, for, the, for the visitors of, of the development. Uh, building E at number eight, the height there was increased. Uh, that was in, in response to uh, looking at the additional employment area space. And number nine, as I mentioned, uh, speaking to the parking requirement. This gives an overlay of really the, the changes of the buildings. And you'll see that uh, there's been some reduction in square footage with some of the changes, uh, some shifting of the buildings, but you also see through those changes that the uh, area of the green space has increased uh, along the channel area and along the waterfront, uh, that area has been maintained as land that will be publicly available. And this is the revised proposal. Uh, the draft plan of subdivision, uh, Ms. Shanks alluded to this and provided some information associated with the draft plan. You'll see the areas in green. Uh, those will be areas that will be provided and conveyed to the municipality through the draft plan process, in addition to Winston Road, uh, which will include that uh, publicly accessible parking. The active usable parkland space, uh, this really looks at how that area is going to be used uh, and the open space area. So those areas combined are approximately 2.5, 2.6 hectares or around six acres. So those areas will work together as part of the waterfront and create that public space that will include both uh, the waterfront trail and landscaped areas and the open channel will provide additional landscape area and connection in a north-south uh, uh, alternative for residents as well. So I wanted to illustrate this just in color to uh, show the amount of land that will be conveyed and the brown or the orange areas are the lands that will be, remain for the future development 
uh, where we will work with the town on really the design of the buildings through the site plan review process and also through any draft plan conditions that may be incorporated. This plan just gives a sense of the trails and the view corridors and the various connections. Uh, you'll see the yellow areas provide kind of the pedestrian movements through the site, uh, visual uh, corridors through the site. Uh, the uh, purple area is Winston Road, so including sidewalks, um, and then the waterfront trail, of course. So there are a number of points of access for pedestrians through the site uh, to the waterfront trail and also view corridors through the site. This is an overall plan illustrating the site in context of the broader area uh, from the regional uh, water treatment facility to the interchange. As I mentioned at the uh, restoration channel, uh, we really see this as, as a restoration area in context of the ditch or the channel that is there now. Uh, the channel will be essentially redesigned and uh, naturalized, as you can see here. Uh, there'll be a uh, top of slope established uh, that will be landscaped and then additional buffer that will include landscaping and a multi-use trail adjacent to Winston Road. And that multi-use trail will provide um, you know, that, that additional connection beyond a sidewalk uh, for people walking or cycling or rollerblading or other forms of transportation than the car. Uh, there's a, a summary of the uh, planning analysis or the peer review analysis provided and we reviewed that in context of a number of details. We also reviewed it uh, and identified that in our review there's been no planning issues identified through this process or at this stage uh, with proposed density, proposed building height increases, the parking calculations which now are intended to uh, comply with the zoning bylaw and the parkland dedication. I think the slide where Ms. Shanks reviewed the various comments uh, provides some good indication of uh, these conclusions and also the recent confirmation today from the region with their support in principle. There are a number of details associated with the design which we'll continue to work with uh, town staff on as we move through the site plan process. Tower design, tower separation, building setbacks, loading, streetscape, landscaping, site lighting. All of those are details that we'll uh, work through in the site plan process with town staff. In context of the policy framework, uh, without getting into all of the policies, uh, we really see that from a provincial policy direction, the growth plan and the provincial policy statement, there's support there for intensification and transit supportive development. The official plan speaks to this area uh, as being within the built boundary, uh, an area identified as a primary focus for intensification identifies view corridors, identifies a site for a mixed use type of development, and provides direction with regard to parkland as far as the location of it and generally the amount uh, of parkland. In our opinion, the proposal that's, uh, that's before, uh, before you for review this evening uh, is in conformity with the intent and direction of the official plan. We are dealing with the application to amend the height, uh, but in all other aspects, it's our opinion that we're in conformity with uh, the official plan. Similarly, we also uh, see the proposal as implementing uh, the policies of the Winston Road secondary plan as it relates to the types of uses, the density of uses, objectives associated with waterfront access, and employment. And we see the proposal as providing for the waterfront open space as identified in the green area, the mix of uses in the red area, the employment within mixed use buildings in the employment overlay, and the channel uh, restoration as identified in uh, the blue north-south 
uh, line within the lands. With the waterfront master plan, again, we see this proposal as uh, really implementing the vision that was developed through the waterfront master plan and integrating and implementing uh, many of the key design directions and objectives associated with the types of uses, uh, the, how the site will integrate within the context of the waterfront, provision for the waterfront promenade and the multi-use trail, and integrating the site uh, within the waterfront. This is a summary of some of the studies. The staff report outlined all the various studies that were completed, uh, that were updated, and that were further uh, revised and resubmitted. So we've been doing a lot of work to address uh, comments uh, through updates and revisions to the studies associated with the proposal. From an economic impact perspective and community benefit, in short, the proposed development would create development charge revenue, future tax revenue, create jobs through construction, and over the longer term through the employment areas. And probably one of the key things as far as a community benefit is it's providing into public ownership that 400 meters of waterfront and trail opportunity and six acres of waterfront lands and public open space. So in summary, uh, in our opinion, the proposal, as I mentioned, is consistent with the direction of provincial planning policy. It's supporting the intensification targets. It's supporting the directions in general as it relates to creating a vision for intensification that is well integrated uh, within the waterfront as the official plan, the waterfront master plan, and the Winston Road Secondary Plan uh, provide direction for. And we'll continue to work with staff uh, to address comments that may be received this evening or through uh, the uh, ongoing review by planning staff as uh, they move forward to a final recommendation report uh, for committee and council consideration. Maybe Sounds like we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aston and uh, Lusani Holmes for that presentation. Um, what I'd like to do at this moment is just recognize in our audience if we have any other uh, counselors that are present um, other than who we have at the at the horseshoe, if you just want to stand up for a quick minute, um, and I'll just uh, recognize you. Uh, I think we've got Councillor Cadwell. Is there any other ones in the in the audience that uh, stand? Is it Councillor Dunstall? Councillor Vane at the back? Am I missing anybody else? Uh, is Count, uh, Regional Councillor Furtick. So thank you for uh, for uh, coming as well this evening. So what we'll do now is we're going to open it up for uh, public uh, questions and answers, and I will ask that the applicants' representatives be available to run up and down to the podium regularly to respond, and we'll direct it whether it's to planning staff or to the applicant, depending on what the question is. Um, so I, I'd again ask that we respect all comments and all viewpoints, uh, maintain some decorum, you take your time, 10 minutes, although there's a clock there, it'll count you down, we'll do the one minute warning, um, uh, but feel free, and uh, after we've gone through everyone, if you think of something else, and we're going through the second round, we might even let you come back for a second question or two after everybody has had a, an initial opportunity to speak. So please feel free to come forward. This is your opportunity to uh, ask questions. Uh, identify yourself, please, your full name, and uh, where you live, your address. If you wanna come to this podium here, we'll turn the mic on and uh, you can just uh, go ahead and ask your question. I will ask all your questions first. Um, I'm gonna record them, and we're, then what we're gonna do is have all your questions answered at once. So we're not gonna do one after, and then answer, and then another, and then answer. Mm -hmm. So list all your questions, if you could please, and then we'll direct them and get them all answered at once. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, I'm Garth Stevenson. I live at uh, 32 Magnolia Crescent, which isn't too far from here. Uh, last night I was at another meeting at the Casablanca Hotel, and I know a lot of you were there too. That was on uh, another subject, the Livingston Avenue 
extension, which has been talked about for a long time. But I was interested, I was sitting at, we sat at round tables there in groups of six to eight people, and one of the men at uh, my table, who was pretty articulate, and when the subject of this came up, he said, oh, well, Lasani always gets what they want. Uh, there's no point uh, even trying to change that. Well, I'm not as cynical as that man, and that's why I'm here. I don't think he is here. Uh, but I think that would be pretty pathetic if that was really the way it was. I'm old-fashioned enough to think that uh, local government is still meaningful in Ontario and that it does have the ability to change things or to resist things which we don't want. So uh, my comment here, my question, if you like, is I fail to understand why this project requires to have buildings as high as 18 or 22 stories. In my opinion, that is incompatible with the kind of small town that Grimsby is supposed to be, or certainly that it was when I moved here uh, nine years ago now. Uh, and uh, I don't think we want that. This isn't New York or Toronto or even Mississauga. I don't want it to look like that. So it seems to me that these people designing this project should be made to put a little water in their wine, to use a French expression. Uh, I'm not suggesting they should cancel the whole project. That would be ridiculous. Parts of it are good. But I fail to see why buildings as high as 18 or 22 stories are needed. I mean, that is a very tall building. Somebody on the CN Tower with a good pair of binoculars will be able to see them if they're ever built. And uh, why do we want that here in Grimsby? I think 14 should be the absolute maximum, 14 stories. And I would like some explanation of why they are insisting on building higher than that. Thank you very much. Uh, OK. Um, I'm going to ask the applicant, please, to uh, come up and respond to the height question. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to respond. I think when we're looking at uh, height and looking at design and considering the policies, we need to look at all of the policies in the broader context of, of what's um, kind of in front of us as we, as we look at designing and giving consideration to implementation of policy. So from a broader policy perspective, we know that this area has been identified as a major intensification area. And so that gives us a starting point for looking at uh, in intensifying the site, a brownfield site, and redeveloping that. There's other policies that give direction as well to uh, looking at development of sites. Uh, density and floor space ratio, uh, how you deal with parkland, and parking and those types of considerations that we presented about and that staff and us have been talking quite a bit about. So as we look at uh, density and height and design, uh, when we look at uh, design direction associated with the waterfront and transitioning height and integrating height, uh, that's where we look at uh, putting the height adjacent to the North Service Road. And again, that's another design direction that's given in, in the background policy. When we look at the height of the buildings and talk about the density, uh, we've also then kind of considered uh, the overall density permissions and taking the height that could all otherwise be built, say, uh, directly adjacent to uh, the proposed Winston Road on our site or within the context of the setback of the parklands. So instead of putting height right at those areas, and having a public realm uh, walking directly beside taller buildings or multiple 14-story buildings, we looked at transitioning that height and putting the higher height toward uh, the intersection and to the North Service Road and transitioning away from uh, the waterfront and the multi-purpose trail. So we need to look at it in that kind of context and making sure that as we're looking at intensification in the design direction, that's where we've moved to uh, propose the additional height in the buildings. Thank you very much for the response. Uh, is there a next question? My name is Stacy McNeil, 204 Main Street West here in Grimsby. A um, couple physical uh, questions and then sort of a uh, 
philosophical question, maybe. Um, as far as the um, site corridors, uh, they've been improved marginally from last time, but they're not that much better. Uh, as uh, uh, SGL pointed out, uh, if you had smaller plates, smaller, um, basically, uh, spots to build your buildings, made them smaller, then the, the, uh, the site corridors would open up substantially. And uh, I haven't seen that there's a, a big improvement in that. The one on the far west, again, I think I mentioned even last time, in order, in order for anybody to actually view down the, the site corridor, you would have to uh, uh, trespass on the property, put your face up against the side of, uh, of a building, and then look like that, and you could just barely see through. Um, that's, that's hardly a site corridor. Uh, and again, all of this could be improved uh, with uh, the smaller plates. I think that that is something that, that, can, uh, that uh, planning development needs to seriously discuss with these folks. The other thing uh, in, that's, uh, that's physical is that we're getting dedicated parkland but the amazing thing about it is that it's on the lake and I don't see any plan for revetment or uh, basically reinforcing the uh, shoreline. And without that, with uh, high water levels in the lake and storms and all the rest, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna lose that property. And so uh, again, the benefit to the town is going to be short lived without uh, the builder actually uh, doing something to reinforce, uh, to armor the, uh, the shoreline, and, and we definitely need that. Uh, the more philosophical question is, uh, for all these lands out there, there's always an employment uh, component, an uh, employment overlay. And again, here, uh, this time, uh, I'm hearing that they do not want to uh, uh, produce a, uh, the required amount of uh, employment on the property. There's uh, something that's been set by, the, uh, by town planning staff. Our expectation is that that is more than just a minor uh, uh, community benefit. It's one of your responsibilities as, as builders to actually uh, do because that's a condition of building your building where, where it's being built. And, and somehow I see that every time anybody has uh, an opportunity, they'll say, we just, we can build housing. We can build lots of housing. But boy, you know, it's really, really tough to actually fill employment buildings uh, out here. Well, that's a responsibility that you took and uh, we ought to hold them to it. Thank you very much. So what I heard was, um, and I'll ask the applicant come up and respond, um, an issue on uh, the site corridors, uh, the um, smaller, smaller buildings would improve sight lines, the dedicated parkland, uh, revetment, uh, revetment what you're proposing there, and your employment overlay, the reduction request to the employment overlay. I think I covered those. If you can address those three. Sure, I'll address two, and then I'll have uh, Mr. Lozani address the third. Uh, and I'll start with the wave uprush. It's really probably the easiest to respond. Uh, there was a full set of uh, slope stability, geotechnical, and engineering reports that uh, were submitted and formed part of the public record that have been uh, reviewed by the Conservation Authority and our understanding those have been generally accepted and, and acknowledged and uh, the setbacks that have been established form the basis for the setbacks uh, that we're using in consideration on the draft plan of subdivision. So that considers uh, reinforcement as required through uh, construction of revetment to consider the wave uprush and the required storms in context of uh, the engineering requirements. So. That is something that was part of the consideration and something that has been reviewed. Um, with regard to the site corridors or the view corridors, again, we're looking to uh, policy. There is a view corridor identified 
uh, the view corridor of, with Winston Road and the open channel uh, is is uh, implementing that uh, view corridor. Uh, in our opinion, the additional view corridors uh, uh, maintain the policy intent. Uh, the design of the buildings in that they're not just a large slab um, rectangular buildings creating a wall across the front of the site, uh, we believe also assists in addressing kind of the overall view corridors uh, of the site. So uh, we believe that the view corridors are, uh, are appropriate, uh, but again, that's something that we'll have more discussion with town staff on as it relates to the overall site plan. But at this point, uh, what we're proposing are, are a number of corridors uh, that provide views and pedestrian connections. And the third employment, Thanks, David. I'm Fred Lozani, um, CEO of Lozani Homes, and I wanted to just identify the answer to the uh, philosophical question. I don't think it's fair to put David on the spot for that. However, on the issue of employment lands, um, we've given that a lot of thought as it relates to you know, providing the full adherence to the 75,000 odd that is requested by the uh, planning staff in the town relative to the 46,000 that we're proposing. And um, I feel, first of all, that we're, we're um, providing for a very substantial footprint of employment lands, uh, given the space or the 50-odd acres of the property overall that we purchased, which is not unlike the size of the property that Lake House was built upon, which is immediately west of us, uh, on the other side of, the, uh, the, of Casablanca along Winston. Uh, similar acreage, and they put out about 18,000 square feet overall. Um, given the same footprint of property, whereas we're putting out more than double that amount. And the calculation that gets to 76,000 is simply a percentage of the overall space that has been built for residential. And in the case of the Lake House property, they chose to go uh, much lower densities. They went low-rise low townhousing, two six-story buildings. And then by virtue of just having very small structure on the same uh, um, size of property, they came up with a much different calculation that related to the, the, uh, the employment lands requirements. Um, because we are going more vertical and we are putting more units on the same, uh, the same uh, um, property, um, we're coming up with a, a smaller than $75,000 number, the 75,000 square foot number, but much bigger than other properties in the area have done. I think that when you talk in terms of intensification and uh, following, the, following policy guidelines, what the province envisioned and what the plan, the, the Grimsby plan envisioned was uh, a higher density than we're actually putting on uh, because the property can take up to 2,000 units. Now, if it took those 2,000 units to, to talk about the height of building issue, please understand that making smaller footprints to provide better you know, uh, fields of vision and, and viewpoints means that you go smaller footprint, greater separation between buildings, and you have to go higher into the, uh, into the sky. If we wanted to hit 2,000 units, we could do it at 12 stories. It would just be a very crowded site, but it would be completely within the allowable limits that we have. The last thing I would mention, and it goes back to employment lands, uh, lands for a minute. If anyone goes down the highway, I, I hope you would see you know, the uh, dedication that we have made as a company that is the preeminent builder of employment properties along the QEW between Hamilton and Niagara. And in most of those buildings that we did build there, we put up without having any tenants in. So we have a great deal of faith in our ability to be able to track the marketplace that you know, uh, will bring employment to this area. And we do it as smart as we can, sometimes taking chances that other individuals in our industry would see as being reckless. Um, we're dedicated to employment lands. We're, it's a very significant part of what we do. However, the new study that came out by the province identifying priority employment lands does not identify any of these zones or for that matter anywhere in Grimsby as priority employment areas. And being that we are very dedicated to providing employment, we do know more than anyone else what is smart employable lands and what is not smart employable lands. This area is very challenged to bring employable lands. If you can imagine law offices, possibly engineering offices, much like we've been able to attract, would be hard to attract in this zone here. And what don't, we don't want to do is provide a building that would have a lot of vacancies within, because I think that that attracts a much lower class of, of tenant, 
uh, and I think that in compliance with the residential that's available there, we have to be careful to make sure that, that it is compliant. So I hope that answered the question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll ask next questions. Hello, my name is Bud Hightower. I'm uh, living at 19 Viking Drive, which is over by the uh, Carmen Avenue area. Been living in the in the ward since 1979. Um, the service road is one of the accesses that we have to get out to this end. When it was the fifth wheel truck stop, we were invariably in difficulty with trucks turning into the property and trying to get back out of the property. Right now, uh, the property is vacant. We come down this way to go to Casablanca to turn go to the, the clubs or whatever the case. And in driving that, the town, uh, the, the lay of the land is such that the road slopes from Casablanca down through the property and then down to the service road to where the, where the pump, the uh, water treatment plant is. And even with nothing there, coming down the service road toward Casablanca, the sight lines prevent anybody from seeing what's coming. My concern is you have 2,000 units or 2,000 cars parking spots with people coming in and out of that land and where are they going to turn? You're going to have three accesses and nobody's going to be able to see it coming in. And invariably um, what's going to happen is people are going to try to make a turn out going into town and we won't be able to see what's coming turning right toward Casablanca. People coming from our side going toward Casablanca won't be able to see the, the cars egressing the property. I don't know that that's been thought about. Thank you. Uh, so if you could address the question about sight lines and uh, traffic and uh, the number of uh, accesses into the development. Thank you. Sure. Uh, to you, Madam Chair, which I haven't been doing, I apologize. Um, as part of the submissions and discussions with uh, town staff, uh, we've been working through uh, uh, traffic impact studies which have looked at the vehicle movements, uh, total number of vehicle mu movements, sight lines, points of access, and uh, there are some recommendations associated with improvements uh, for turn lanes uh, into the site. Uh, so that's, uh, that has certainly been something that has been on the mind of uh, people reviewing the applications. So what I'm hearing is there's more to come on that. Um, there's still more. Sorry, through, through to your question. Um, the, the traffic studies have been reviewed and comments have been received through Public Works. Maybe uh, planning staff could confirm after I'm done here. Um, many of the design changes associated with the plan, draft plan of subdivision were completed. Um, so w we see the traffic study as uh, generally being accepted. There may be some other uh, details that we would work through, perhaps as condition of draft plan approval, or the actual site accesses and final designs as part of the site plan approval. So in that sense, yes, there'll be a little more detail uh, done. Uh, hello, I'm George Trefanovic, <clears throat> 468 Main Street, West Grimsby. Um, a few comments or that, that I have is regarding this uh, development. Is It's in the urban boundary um, and there's a pretty significant and uh, I think quite a, a bold and unique opportunity <clears throat> for Grimsby to have this building built for our community and the entire Niagara region has a, a huge housing problem and it's always about toning things down knocking things down not letting people build so we have like a world-class development <clears throat> team here putting together bending over backwards and listening to which is important that the that the you know that we hold them their feet to the fire to make sure that we get what we want what we need but we have to move and make the development happen <clears throat> and we have to meet 
density requirements. It's Metrolinx and the province has mandated that we move to develop and have the density we need. To put this uh, build, building into place, the pipes and the infrastructure that has to be built into this, and then you want us to say, well, we can't build anything, we'll just have a few, you know, a thousand units instead of 1,200 plus and change units, means that while the cost per unit is gonna go higher, and no doubt those costs, somebody will be willing to pay eventually for those, uh, uh, you know, more expensive units that have to be built because they're not allowed to add on the, on the stories that are needed. <clears throat> the direction from the province has been, and uh, from Metrolinx, we're gonna get a GO train station. We have a great opportunity now to get public transit so we don't have to have so many cars. So we don't have to have gridlock on our streets and on the Queen E. We can open up ourselves to tour the tourist industry that avoids us because who the heck wants to be stuck on the Queen E for three hours to get from you know Niagara on the Lake to, to Toronto? Like it's just a ridiculous uh, option. So let's I think we should allow building to happen to allow more height, more density. This is not, you know, this is in the urban, our urban boundary. And we should allow th these developments to happen. Ultimately, it will, it will result in people having options for mixed house use to move into and to, uh, you know, for people that are getting older like me, maybe I want to move to a condo. Maybe I don't want to shovel my snow anymore. Then I'll sell my house and then somebody can move in there, somebody younger. And then I can move into a condo where those things can be looked after. Uh, there's aging population. There are all kinds of considerations in that nature that have to be made. And it just, there's such a nitpicking about all these things that are happening that I just think are ridiculous. And we have a housing crisis in Niagara. And it's been written by Mr. Willis Craft in the, we had, they had a four part series about the <clears throat> dire need for housing and for the people that are suffering you know, in shelters and food banks and everything else, they have no dignity. So this is an opportunity now for Grimsby to build and make something worthwhile. And I think this is an excellent start. And we should just, you know, pull our horns in a little bit and then respect the uh, community that needs this opportunity to have housing. That's all. Thank you. Uh, I didn't hear any questions in that. It was more comments, but thank you. Um, next. Thank you. Okay, I'm Eva Rengi and I live at 19 Viking Drive. Um, and uh, my comments are actually a reaction to yours. Um, I wanted to follow through with my, my husband's. I think it's the number of vehicles that are um, going to be coming out of that development that are, are going to add to the traffic that we're going to see coming from Viking Drive, which is further over that way. We already have a problem with all the cars coming from the west side of Casablanca when we want to cross Casablanca. Uh, so that's just an addition to that. But uh, as far as the density targets, do the ten city targets have to be met? I mean, why do we have to have um, that many um, people in, in, in that area? We already have uh, the devel developments on the other side of Casablanca, um, and there's a lot of density over there already. Um, and as far, yes, Grimsby does need 
um, housing. Grimsby needs affordable housing. Grimsby needs affordable housing for the people who live in Grimsby, not more condos for the people who are moving in from Toronto because they can afford to buy a condo here and have all kinds of money in their pocket. Um, as, I mean, we've thought about it. Uh, we're not so sure that if we sold our house on Viking Drive that we could afford a condo um, uh, in one of those buildings. Thank you. Okay, so I, thank you. I didn't hear a comment. Um, I, well, I heard comments, not a question. But um, I, did have, I did have one question about dens density, your density tra targets there. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Basic to respond to uh, what the town's density targets are for the urban boundary in that area. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the, the town's density targets are a range, and they're, uh, they're based on uh, not necessarily units per acre. In this particular neighborhood, uh, the density targets are based on floor space because they're mixed-use designations. And uh, the target is a minimum of one um, times the lot area and the maximum is three times the lot area. So whatever the lot area is, uh, you have to build at least that amount of floor space, and but no more than three times the lot area in floor space. So there's a range. I mean the population density, not the, not the so I think she means population. So, okay, so I, I think, I don't know if that answers that. Um, there's, so there's two density questions. One that Walter just answered, Mr. Basic answered, which is the, the density requirement under the um, secondary plan. Uh, for that particular zoning of mixed-use high density under the official plan policy. And then the other density targets that uh, the town has, which are uh, we have a greenfield density target and then the regional official plan targets her density um, for um, the other areas of the town, which is 80%, uh, uh, I believe, is supposed to be infill, that, that calculation. If you can just explain that one. The 80% the number refers to um, intensification. Uh, but intensification is only within uh, calculations are within within the uh, rel relative to the green yeah the relative to the greenfield area and uh, relative to what's uh, considered redevelopment <clears throat> of existing developed lands right yes. so uh, the target is that by 2015 um, the new development that'll be occurring within Grimsby, 80% of that new development will be within built up areas as opposed to uh, greenfield areas. So, and this is a built up area. Any other questions uh, from the public? My name is David Ward and I live at 389 Kerman Ave. Not so much a question, Again, more comments for council to deliberate and planning staff. Unfortunately, uh, I don't think these people were invited to the meeting last night and they should have been. Any discussion about traffic, we just went crazy last night with the projections. This area is, it's gonna be unbelievable. And adding the kind of development that they're proposing is just sheer insanity. I want to say that their comments about intensification, we need it. Well, from zero to adding units that are 12 stories in heights, which is what the plan asks for, is intensification we've gone from zero to 12 stories on any building the other thing that i have a problem with are the way the buildings are designed if you look at the plan and actually you don't really get to see a good picture but the top will show you driving along the service road it's basically just a wall of buildings and I know that, you know, that's money, but it's our town and we'd like to look at the lake. It doesn't have to be the whole 
thing, but we should be able to see the lake. So my suggestion to planning staff is that we look at reorienting the buildings to run 90 degrees from the lake to the road and that they be properly separated so that you can accommodate a view and also it will cut down on the number of people and the total development, but it'll still be development. And after all, we've done our fair share and we, I'm sorry, I, I don't really want to denigrate the previous gentleman that was talking, but we've done our fair share and we're not to solve the housing problems of the whole Niagara region. We've got to solve the housing problems in Grimsby. And I want to reiterate that none of the development that's going to be here is probably going to be affordable to the people who live here. Thank you. Uh, oh, I didn't get a question out of that. It was comments, but thank you. Um, and I'll ask if anyone else wishes to come forward. Okay, my name is Michael Oliver Morrison. I live at 214 North Service Road in Grimsby. I'm 18 years old, and I uh, kind of want to have a voice. So uh, if you're here with us tonight, odds are you probably are pretty passionate about this issue, as am I, and uh, I have a rather strong opinion about this development. The question I'd like to ask is more so directed at the lovely people I'm blessed to share my home with, and uh, my question is designed to boil this topic down to a very simple yes or no question. I would ask for the participation of the people that are listening to me. It would help this, uh, help this cause out a lot. Just a simple yes or no, all in favor. If, if you had a choice between yes or no, would you like to see the development? Hands up. Okay, that's fair. Respectable. Who would rather not see this development? Okay, so that's probably about 80% of the people here tonight. Um, just, just to make that known, about 80% of the people. Uh, where was I? If I'm going to come up here and make a statement like that, it'd be kind of rude of me not to present an alternative. Um, we've got lots of, of vacant space just up the hill. If we want something like this for affordable housing, why can't we uh, put something up there? It doesn't need to be as fancy. It can be a little uh, more toned down, more affordable. Anything that would uh, provide affordable housing, like this is not affordable housing. You can look on Kijiji right now and see all the, t all the uh, apartments and condos in the new place Polonaise area. That's all, like, for a one-bedroom or two-bedroom place, that's at least 1500 or more. Anybody looking for affordable housing, you wouldn't find it here. Um, I work in the moving industry myself, so I see the trends of where people are moving and how people are moving, and the kind of people that we'd be attracting to a location like this, it wouldn't be people who are looking for housing within the Niagara region. It would be people that are looking for housing from the Toronto area, trying to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city, and it would, it's essentially going to turn this area into more industrialized area like that. Um, that's pretty well it. Um, those were my points. And uh, yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the gallery wish to speak? This is uh, your opportunity to come forward and ask some questions. I'll do the going once, going time. Catherine Gonson, 202 Ridge Road West in Grimsby. I think this is a perfect place for the density targets in Grimsby. And there's an opportunity for some really beautiful living accommodation here where you have Sunset views over Lake Ontario and sun from the west in the escarpment and the fall changes of the colors. Um, I like the design, but I'm crazy enough to think that that could look like a Caribbean cruise ship and really be cool. That's all. Thank you. Um, anyone else thought of a question? My name is Daphne Davis. I'm at 41 McNabb Drive. And a couple questions that came to me are, I wonder when would it warrant traffic lights on the North Service Road for the two exits of Winston Road coming out for this large mount? So I'd be interested in knowing how 
big it is. Be one thing to add a left or right turn lane on the Norris service road, but to actually get on to the service road, those people entering with the poor sight lines, that would be an issue. I think a number of us did not understand Mr. Basic's explanation of the 80% um, intensification comment, if that could be addressed. I haven't heard the size of the units in these high rises, like the, the floor space for um, living accommodation. And I noticed that some of the buildings right now, the next question would be about the views. I see a lot of them are built now. We're seeing nothing but um, lights on in the finished buildings with no south exposure lights at all. I think they're all hallways in the present buildings. And it's a shame. They have no escarpment views. They're probably trying to avoid the noise of the QE. But for people living in these, I'm not sure where they're getting to look. And I do feel sorry for how tight they are together. So I heard a couple of questions. Um, uh, the applicant can respond to the traffic question about um, the intersections and when they'll be lighted. And then uh, I'll get, uh, and the size of the units and the floor space. Uh, a bit about the views, and I think you can, maybe you can comment on the other building, which is, I think, the LGM, which is front-loaded, and why that looks different from what yours is going to look like. And then I'll have Mr. Basic respond to the intensification question again. Yeah. Uh, through Madam Chair, we'll tag-team this one as well. Uh, with regard to the traffic lights, as far as the traffic impact study and review, there are no lights warranted. Uh, through the traffic uh, study analysis. We'll, uh, I don't have a copy with me, but perhaps we can confirm that uh, for the, the staff report and make sure that's addressed. But to my knowledge, there's no lights warranted. Um, with regard to the unit ranges, uh, just confirmed with our architect that you know, we still work through floor plates and designs as we work through site plan, but at this point, uh, there's a mix of one bedroom and and two bedrooms and variations in between there uh, in the proposal of 430 to you know, 1,000, 1,100 square feet. So there's a good range of different unit types, but again, uh, that could evolve through time as the design evolves. And uh, uh, Mr. Lozani will discuss with regard to uh, the overall design and single loaded, but what I can simply say is uh, there's no single loaded corridors uh, there will be uh, views in all directions, escarpment views and lake views. Thank you, David. And through you, Madam Chair, my apologies for not having addressed that previously. Um, you know, a very good comment made with regards to the approach that some other developers have taken as it relates to, you know, what version of themselves they're showing, you know, to the QEW and to the escarpment. And I do not share the vision that many of them have as it relates to having uh, single view corridors um, where you're essentially stuccoing off everything that is on the south side and uh, you know to, so that you have this audience of of a lakefront in Toronto on the north side what we've chosen to do is to uh, double load hallways and have units that do front on to the QEW and the escarpment to be true units fully balconied with full facades um, I like that approach. I live on the escarpment in Grimsby, uh, see the fall colors come in and the spring as it gets green. And I think there's uh, nothing to be ashamed of there. In fact, we're looking forward to celebrating those great views. And that way, when you're coming down the highway, you will see, you know, a full distinctive three-dimensional, uh, you know, uh, living arrangement that exists there. Thank you. Um, Mr. Basic, can you respond to the intensif clarify a bit on the intensification? And maybe it might also help if um, you could clarify where we're going with the regional official plan and the population expectations for intensification in Grimsby um, to 2041, if they're working on that and how that impacts this development. I'll start with the region. The region is currently working on their new official plan. Um, which will address uh, intensification targets and population projections for the various municipalities within within the region of Niagara. Um, uh, we we haven't uh, 
they haven't achieved any policy. So once the official plan is adopted, uh, probably in two to three years, then they'll have they'll have numbers with respect to population projections to 2041, which is the planning period for Grimsby, for Town of Lincoln, West Lincoln, St. Catharines, and so on. And then it'll be a uh, responsibility of the municipalities to adjust their respective official plans to conform to the regional official plan. Uh, so we don't have those numbers yet. Uh, with respect to the 80% uh, intensification number, uh, what Ms. Shanks has uh, shown up there is our uh, Schedule A to our official plan. Um, the yellow areas are built up areas. The uh, green hatched areas within the urban boundary are designated greenfield areas. So what that 80% figure says in our official plan is that uh, by 2015, which is five years ago, um, at least 80% of all new development shall be within the yellow area and not in the green area. We have, we won't have any we won't have any problem reaching that figure because there's very little land left within the hatched green area uh, that's residential. So uh, we'll be well above well above that number of 80%. So that's what that 80% number is. It's not it's not um, how much development is going to occur. It's where the development occurs within the uh, uh, urban area of the town of Grimsby. Thank you. I think what I'm hearing too is that you know, people just wanted, and people are looking for an idea as to how many bodies we're going to be putting into town and how that intensification number is going to work its way out. Um, with what, and we do have a number in the in the in our plan in our official plan right now that to 2031, I believe that a targeted population that we're supposed to, which we have, I believe, exceeded. Um, 33,000 um, by 2031, 20, 30. and I think that we're at 30 some odd thousand now. So I think the question is, how close are we to our, if we're that close to our 2031 target, yeah, there, I think it's just, and how, much and, and how much land is left and those kind of questions. But that's, that's another discussion for another day, and I'm sure anyone who wishes to expand on that further uh, can email Mr. Basic and, um, or give him a call and have that conversation. Okay, any other questions from the public? Um, when, everybody's starting to think of a whole bunch of more questions. Okay, this could go tell, this can go all night. We're not in a rush to get home to watch any games or anything. Quick, Andrew Sinclair, I'm at uh, 16 Pierre Trudeau Lane over in the uh, Brant Haven area. Um, I just wanted uh, a point to be made that Mr. Losani made um, last year in the meeting, and maybe I'll get Mr. Basic to comment on it first of all, but they are allowed to build a 14-foot rectangle right up to the edge of the land uh, with a density of three. And what they're proposing is pulling it back and making it taller at a density way lower than three. Is that correct, that they're actually uh, well below what they're required? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, in relation to the comment, uh, again, our opinion is there's the ability through the policy to look at a 14-story building right uh, up to the, the uh, property limits to the one extent, then other considerations as far as hazards and that, but essentially uh, along the waterfront. Uh, so, yes. And with regard to the density and the floor, uh, floor space ratio based on the lot area, uh, what we're proposing, what started out in, in the ballpark of 1.8 FSR based on the lot area is below the uh, three times FSR that would be permitted. Thank you. Uh, Little Linda Hand from 18 Cedar Street. The one question I have is for Mr. Lozani. How do you come back and increase the number of units? And you've cut down, it appears on the, um, the site plans that you've cut down on a lot of the space, uh, the green space, the park space. Is that true? Is that? No, it's not. It's not, but, okay, but like, like the number 
of units has increased on this, right? And the height has gone, like the, uh, like the height that's allowed is 12 stories, right? How do you come up to 22? Like I understand that you've given a little more park space, have you not? <coughs> have you given us extra yeah. park space? But how do you get to 22? stories is my question really. I'm just going to I'm just if you finished your question I'll yeah. just I'll ask if you can just um, sit and then I'll have the applicant respond. Thank you Ms. Ann. They're not as mean as I look. It's it's okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I believe uh, through Madam Chair we addressed kind of the context of the height uh, with regard to the unit count. Again really that's a function of the different mix of unit types between you know, a one bedroom unit type and a two bedroom unit type. So that's uh, kind of been evolving as we've looked at the space. And recall as we looked at increasing uh, the height into the one building uh, to 14 stories to add some additional uh, square footage for employment along the frontage with North Service Road, that also had a bit of a ripple effect in the tiering as it moves back in the building. So the overall floor space ratio goes down uh, from from a percentage, but the unit count has somewhat changed based on the types of <coughs> units uh, uh, within the building footprint, and the overall green space has has increased marginally. So that's how that will work. And that unit count number, again, that that probably evolves as we work through the design. Uh, but what I would just reference is that uh, the unit count isn't the test of density, it's that floor space ratio and the overall building designs that are going to kind of result in what the final unit count ends up being. The other, the other component of that, of course, is how we deal with parking uh, with unit count. So that will all work itself out as we get into uh, uh, the further detailed design and the site plan stage. Thank you. Uh, any further questions from the public? Thank you. You're allowed. We're going on the second round now. Just wanted to make a comment in regard to the apparent gift of the green space. Actually, if anybody looks at the official plan for the town, you'll see a large strip of hazardous land. They can't build anything there. They're not giving us anything. They're just fixing it up. But that's appreciated. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Unless you'd like to comment on that comment. Um, if I, if I don't see any, I'm going to do the one, two, three again, and then we're going to, okay. No, it always happens. Like, I think that this uh, reiteration is an improvement from the last time, and that was based on the input and feedback from the community and the council. So it's not that we're gifting anybody anything. I think that they've listened to us and they've made an improvement. And I, I think that's a good thing that we did what we did, and it's a good thing that the developers came forward to make the improvement. <clears throat> Another thing is, there's been a lot of talk about the traffic with having this many people move in. But we have to realize that this will coincide with the GO train station this will coincide with hopefully a Niagara region-wide uh, transit system, which we really don't have <clears throat> in Grimsby or Beamsville, like, to my knowledge, in Beamsville anyways. So if we get some proper public transit, we're not going to need, like everybody here, you know, the fat cats that are here, we, everybody has their own car and drive wherever we want to go, when we want to go. But if we have the opportunity to have bus transits and Uber and taxis and whatever, you know, maybe we don't have to be two, three car families anymore. And that'll hopefully reduce some of the traffic and alleviate. So 
I don't know, in terms of <clears throat> uh, if, there, if there's been any studies or uh, what the expectation is of how many cars per unit will be in the new uh, development or in general, uh, if anybody could answer that question, as opposed to what we have now in our community because if you don't have a car, it's not easy to move, move around. So I, what I, I got one question out of there and I'll ask the applicant just to respond to maybe if uh, the number of cars that uh, are anticipated per unit has been factored into the parking calculation or, or the site. Yeah. Sorry, through Madam Chair, uh, we're just looking at the parking because we've been working through the town's parking, uh, the shared parking analysis, but essentially it's 1.5 spaces per uh, per each unit. Um, and then there's employment spaces and, and that also factored in um, to that approach. Thank you. So um, I'm going to give one last uh, question, uh, time for the public to come up with any questions. Um, and and I'm going to try to, then I'm going to move to the, so let's, I think this is going to be it, and then we're going to go to the committee. Davis, 41 McNabb. My question is about fire and the height of the buildings and how Grimsby is able to manage any fire. Just, uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just in general terms, um, our, our fire department has had an opportunity to review this application, and uh, um, they haven't identified any any concerns with regard to the proposal. Now, uh, but in general terms, taller buildings are required to be uh, self-protecting. So, in other words, uh, they're. Um, uh, with sprinkler systems and the, the way they're constructed is uh, in terms of fire protection is safer than uh, the buildings that aren't built in that build in that way. But that's something that's addressed through the through the building code. Um, other than that, um, I really don't have much much further to add to that. Yeah. Um, again, after. After this process, again, we're dealing with uh, zoning uh, to determine setbacks, building height, um, land use. Uh, we're creating lot lines at this time, uh, how much parkland is to be dedicated, how much land is to be, um, and draft plan conditions identifying what work needs to be done in order to accommodate what's being proposed. So that's where we're at right now. It's still very early in the process, relatively speaking. Um, we still have uh, site plan applications, so there will be a separate site plan application required for each block that's being proposed. Uh, that will have to be reviewed in detail, so we, we get into very detailed analysis at that point uh, in terms of how the buildings are proposed, how they look. Um, the fire departments really get really really gets involved at that point also, and the building department. And, uh, and then there's the building permit applications where they do the actual structural review of the buildings themselves. So there's still a lot of work to be done before uh, a shovel can go into the ground and anything can be developed. Uh, so we're still, like I said, very high level at this point, uh, very early on in the process. And uh, there will be a lot of very detailed analysis still to come. Thank you. Um, another opportunity for anyone a last burning question. I see a hand. Well, I just wanted to respond to the gentleman, I, I, I don't know his name, who said that uh, we're all going to give up our cars if we have public transit. There is nothing in North American history that lends any support to that uh, assumption. People like their cars, they like the freedom of their cars. Uh, if they can afford more than one, they'll get more than one. I just bought one for my wife today, so I know that. But uh, I don't believe there is going to be, in my lifetime, a GO Transit station at Casablanca, unless maybe there's a change of government at Queen's Park, certainly not from the present government. And as for the uh, 
proposed uh, regional transit system in Niagara, well, I see no sign that that's ever going to happen. But even if it did, nobody's going to give up their cars unless they uh, fail the driver's test or they're too old or infirm or don't have a space to put it, but people love their cars. That's our whole way of life is based on that. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to close the public session now unless we have any new uh, new comments from people who have not yet spoken. If there's no one that has not yet spoken that wishes to come to the mic. Again, I, I you know if you're sensing that there's something that you haven't been able to say and you want to add to it or um, add some further comments to what comments you've heard, please put them in writing and send them to planning at Grimsby CA or your, and CC your ward counselor. Everything that you're going to say tonight and everything you put in writing that comes to email to the planning staff will be uh, considered and incorporated into the matrixes and into the information provided uh, as they consider their report. So it is important and you have an opportunity still after this evening to contribute to that. So. Um, this, is, this isn't your final opportunity to, uh, to make those comments. Um, I'm going to move around the table and just ask if anyone wishes to seek clarification from the applicant on, on, on what's being proposed. This is an opportunity for us just to ask questions as well. Um, please use your mic and turn your mic off when you're done because we are uh, being recorded. Um, am I seeing Councillor Sharp wishes to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, so I have some questions for the applicant is um, what is the size of the property and and what is the size less the uh, parkland dedication <coughs> I have a couple questions so I'll just ask him if um, what's the size of the property um, less the parkland dedication what is the total size of of the built structure like as far as gross floor area um, how much of that gross floor area is commercial and what is the sorry let me rephrase what's the gross floor area of residential the gross gross floor area of commercial and then the total gross floor area and then what is the density as far as the GFA versus lot size and the um, persons and jobs per hectare. Thank you. Okay, I'll ask if the applicant can come up. If you didn't get those all, um, I'll let you know if we miss one as you respond. I'll let you know too. <laughs> I might get uh, some help from some of our team here as well. Hopefully, um, the overall site area is seven hectares uh, the remaining area of land uh, for development that doesn't include uh, so the parkland the open space the road widening and the roads which would all be excluded into public uh, would be approximately 4.2 hectares um, overall square footage again uh, based on current concept which will evolve as we get through site plan design is approximately a million square feet. Uh, all buildings total with uh, approximately 46,000 for the employment. Uh, we're still kind of working through the other commercial related uses that, uh, that might be included. So there's a bit of um, kind of plus or minus in, in those areas. So just for clarification, that was a, a million. So a million square feet total gross floor area, and then forty six hundred forty six thousand commercial. And so then. How much is that? That's 950,000 square feet of, of residential, roughly 954,000. Yes. Um, with regard to people and jobs per hectare, I think um, something probably we can 
work with staff on the overall calculations on, on people and jobs. Um, but as far as kind of overall ratios of people, um, again, it's going to really depend on average uh, number of people per unit. But if there's, you know, plus or minus 1,300 units, uh, if there's an average of two or probably maybe less than two, um, then uh, there's plus or minus 2,600 people. Um, again, that's going to be, uh, we'll need to determine that based on uh, perhaps how other of your documents determine your average persons per unit to get us to that density, but that gives some general uh, indication of overall population. And employment will relate to the, you know, the overall square footage and type of employment. And I think that's something we could confirm and work through with staff for the staff report um, to give that uh, information for an overall uh, density for the lands. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not done yet. Um, so further, I have some questions that are, I have one question for staff and one question for you. Um, to staff, is there, how do we calculate the amount of persons and jobs per hectare based on the, the size of the development? There's, is there a formula to calculate that per standard planning practices? Like if there's a certain amount of units or a certain amount of floor space and um, we can calculate how many persons that is roughly? And then can we calculate how many jobs based on the number of persons? Because I think I've seen that. Um, the, 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 the persons per hectare is uh, based on um, averages that uh, we gain from uh, census um, based on different types of units. So apartment units, as an example, have a lower persons per unit ratio than detached dwellings, as an example. So uh, we use uh, as detailed census information as we can to achieve that number. Uh, in, in terms of employment uh, jobs per hectare, uh, we rely mainly on the region to provide us with uh, uh, the most recent um, uh, data uh, to use to, to make that calculation. And the last thing is, it goes to, I guess, staff or the developer. Um, I see parking on the south service road or the north service road um, along the curve. It looks like those vehicles are going to have to back out onto the south service road. And it's kind of already a blind corner. Is I, I can't tell from this. So the parking on the south side of the development, which looks like it's on the north service road, does that access onto the north service road, or how do you get out of those spots? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, those spots are all accessed from that internal uh, laneway or driveway. Uh, there's no access to the service road uh, saving except for the specific access points identified on the site plan. Thank you. Um, anyone else around the table? Uh, Councillor Vardy? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, as I understand it, this isn't the, the evening for councillors to give comments, but really ask questions for clarification. Uh, I will make one comment, though, and that's for Michael Oliver, and I didn't get your last name. Yeah, I remember you, and I want to say continue uh, your interest in community politics. That's really important, and I'm happy to talk to you any time about your future. Um, Okay, so that's one thing. The, uh, the next question is for Mr. Lusani. You know, I'm looking at uh, the pictures of this and I'm wondering, when Toronto looks across the lake, will it see itself reflected back? My... Is that a question? Is that a question? Yes. Uh, given, well, I have more though. You may as well wait till, till you get them all. 
Uh, just given that, you know, the official plan says 12 stories, and that's not looking like 12 stories. Um, so I'd like to know if these are condos or apartments. Um, if they're condominiums, I want to know if you're also affiliated, will you also be affiliated with the management company uh, that will look after them? I'd like to know uh, some examples of size of units and what you think their approximate cost would be. Um, those are all of mine. Thank you. Um, through you, Madam Chair, could you please just help me summarize those questions again for clarity? So um, when Toronto looks this way, are they going to see their reflection? Um, and then uh, 12, we have 12 stories as a max in our official plan. Will, I, I think the question is, why are we not 12 stories? And then the next one is, are they condos or apartments? And uh, will you also do, because you have a management side of your business, will you also be the management company for these? Um, and again, reiterating the size of your units and the potential cost of your units. Thank you, Madam Chair. To the first question, um, you know, I believe I have a very, very strong grasp of what makes Grimsby unique and attractive and, um, and beautiful to everyone who comes to visit or wants to come and live here throughout the 24 odd years that we've been building in this community. And because I am a citizen of the community, the amount of pride that we take in the architecture that we've promoted over the years, including the four um, distinct and individual residences that we, um, that we had designated through the Heritage Society, we take great pride in what we do here in Grimsby and we take our job very seriously here and I believe that when our job is done on this particular community that Toronto will look across the water and will see the very best of itself and the very best of our community and will wish that they were living there as well and I, I strongly believe that. Uh, condo, apartment or otherwise pretty much the same thing they're just different ways of saying the exact same thing and whether it's an apartment condo or uh, this space is oftentimes mistaken in name by virtue of what it means from a legal entity. So a condominium is just another way of saying an apartment. It just describes what the legal description of it is, uh, which is that it's in ownership, uh, but it's part of a larger corporation. So a condominium ownership is, is just that. Every individual has a share of that building uh, defined in their individual apartment. The word apartment is usually known as, you know, it's, it's, it's annotated typically in the past as being associated with rental um, of which may have there may be a, a, an opportunity for that here as well as part of our, our job as property managers we we do both residential rental apartments and we also do the uh, commercial and we haven't really taken a position as to which side of the equation we want to be here as, as to whether we sell the entire thing to market or that we actually bring it into our management stream the size of the units uh, as indicated previously uh, really, I think it's just under the 500 square foot mark, which provides the, uh, you know, even at a, a number of uh, $700 a foot would provide a, a unit in the low 200,000s, which is unheard of in Grimsby. So if it doesn't meet the, um, you know, description of affordability, it's hard to find affordability. And, uh, but it could be as high as $2,500 uh, uh, 2, square feet, I should say. And individuals do have the opportunities if they wish to to buy you know, two units and combine them together. Um, as to the last question, uh, we do, um, we do uh, property management, mostly on the industrial side, and we really have no interest in being, um, uh, being the property management company for these buildings. So we will not be a part of that. I hope that answers the questions. Thank you. Um, Member Warner. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I just have three questions, um, really to planning staff as well as the developer. Um, so after the last meeting, I know I had followed up with planning staff and um, I had asked that question at the meeting as well about um, the condos or, or whatever we're going to call them and how, what the impacts would be. Understanding the school board has, you know, has yet to, I believe, provide uh, significant comments. No, 
Um, but saying that, so I'm, I'm basing this question on, on the information I got from the last meeting where it was assumed that these um, structures would not house many school-aged children. So they're going to be, um, you know, young professionals coming from Toronto that have no desire to start a family or um, basically uh, recent retirees. But when will the school board, if these young professionals that were, that were enticing to come across the lake or you know, partly around the lake, my question is, when will the school board provide some, some comments? Because really, I mean, doing the math, you're talking well over 2,000 people. So that's my first question. The second question um, is really to the town, maybe not even the planning staff. So what initiatives is the town taking to improve access throughout Grimsby to accommodate all these new residents and to improve or increase the amenities? Um, or are we presuming that all of these people, being that they're coming from across the lake and other municipalities, are going to shop there? Thereby not you know, shopping downtown, because as we all know, it's pretty difficult to get downtown outside of regular business hours, weekends, et cetera. So I'm just curious, does the town have a plan going forward if we're bringing all these people in? The last question, and this is more of a cl uh, clarification, so it might be my interpretation. It was noted if the height decreases, which I know is a, a huge concern for many people, if we do lower in height and meet the official plan, which I would support, um, it was noted, um, I'm sorry, I forget your name, the gentleman that was speaking, that, that the buildings would extend further to the property line. But being that we, we do have a commitment of the green space, and in particular at the lake, how would that impact, I mean, we might get a little less than what's recently been provided, but we would still, I, I, I want a confirmation that we would still get the guaranteed green space that was originally discussed, um, and what would that result in other than losing units? So those are my three questions. Thank you. So <coughs> I'll, get, um, I'll get Mr. Basic to respond to what involvement the school board has in, in the conversation on uh, new developments and um, what initiatives the town has to improve access, and I'm expecting you mean by improving access that means transportation, transit, um, or just to the waterfront, or? Through you, Madam Chair, just to clarify, it's just the means of getting from one end of town to another, as well as improving, improving or increasing the amenities that we currently have, being that it's quite insufficient for the population we have now. I was just trying to get clarification on what you meant by improving access, thank you. And so, and also uh, the amenities question which you addressed. And then I'll ask the applicant to respond to the question about if we go down in height, what happens to the, to the corresponding green space. So I'll let Mr. Basic respond first. Thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Um, the school boards are all circulated. Um, the French school board, uh, separate school board, as well as the public school board. And, uh, um, they don't have to respond, they're not required to, uh, but if they do respond, we give them a, a specific time frame to respond to it. I don't believe they have responded, so uh, no response is often a, um, uh, we have no objections. Keep going on the other question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, transport within Grimsby as a whole, um, the region as well as the town um, regularly uh, do an analysis of traffic within the municipality uh, to see how people get from one part of town to the other and whether or not improvements need to be made to the existing infrastructure that's, uh, that's already there uh, in order to do that. So it, it is monitored and, and if improvements are required, uh, that's something that either the regional council, if it's a regional road, would have to address or the local municipality uh, would have to address if it's, if it's uh, a local road that we're talking about that needs improvement in order to accommodate additional traffic. Um, with regard to amenities, um, the, uh, I'm assuming that when you say amenities, you're not necessarily just talking about parks, you're talking about um, commercial, you're talking about um, uh, schools also, <laughs> everything, right? Yeah, and and uh, yeah, these things are also all considered. Um, the commercial amenities are obviously a, 
uh, supply and demand issue. If you have more people, you're going to get the potential for uh, a need for additional amenities, and it's the it's the businesses that actually will want to come here and provide that service to the people that that come to the town. Um, uh, but in terms of uh, uh, amenities that the municipality itself provides, like arenas and parks and things like that, um, that's something that our, our Parks Department is keenly uh, interested in. And uh, there's a Parks Master Plan that was recently approved, as an example, uh, which included not just parks, but it also included other, other facilities like arenas and, and baseball parks and things like that. And uh, um, they take future population projections into account, including this particular site. So uh, the, the potential of this site has been taken into consideration in the Parks Master Plan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if staff or whoever has control of the presentation, could you go to the uh, one that has the proposed applications? It's the very first slide. Second slide, sorry. There we go. So just to give some context of kind of the question, uh, Building D is being proposed at 14 stories. So if you remove two stories, but if you took the, that building and if you drew it as a rectangle all the way out to the edge of the townhouses as one large slab rectangle, that would be permitted. So that gives some idea of, of that. And that would be permitted in blocks in really any orientation, whether that ran east-west along the waterfront trail or east-west along the service road. So that's what, what we're talking about when we're taking the height and shifting it into taller buildings to integrate and work with the transition as it relates to the waterfront trail. Thank you. But there is really no reason to make it rectangular. I mean, you could... Um, have a similar design just two floors down or in particular this is a 14-story building so it's not as prevalent as you know obviously the intent of my question which is the 22 and 18 so if you tiered it and I and under, I understand it would go down you would have less units but you would still only be able to go to um, I guess the road on the <coughs> north side of the townhomes is that correct Understanding if you kept this design and tiered it from 12 story or around there instead of the 22 or 18, you could still do it, but you would get less units, but you would not surpass, let's say, I don't know if it's the property line or not, or the road um, north of the townhomes. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, there's a number of ways that tiering could work, and the question was talking about what would be permitted, uh, my understanding. So uh, just trying to give that sense, and if we're looking at kind of the 18 and 22 stories, it would be how do we work within the context of the overall uh, unit? So it, it, are there different approaches to tiering? Yes, we. Uh, but what would be permitted is, um, you know, that, time, that type of rectangular uh, with kind of shifting away from the 18 and 22 stories, um, the ultimate design could change as well uh, within the context of how the buildings are oriented and the overall massing on the site. So I think what, what again, kind of just back to what we're proposing, we believe that the approach and that the height uh, is working within you know, the broader policy uh, directions and considerations. Thank you. Uh, would that answer your questions, or do you have any further questions, Member Warner? You're okay. Uh, I'm just going to ask uh, Member Stubbing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got a, a few questions, so apologies for that. Um, just before I, I get into those questions, can I just see, uh, seek clarification from the applicant? Um, you, you don't have a transportation specialist present tonight? 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, we don't have our transportation expert here tonight, correct? Thank you. Okay. Um, I will uh, avoid asking some of the technical questions I have on the synchro model then. Um, I, I think, Madam Chair, th uh, through you, uh, and these are a mixture to the planners uh, as well as to the applicant. Um, we're discussing the changing of zoning uh, from a neighbourhood development to a high-density uh, mixed-use site. Um, I think the, the issue of access and egress uh, from such a site is a key component in, in justifying such a, a zoning change. Um, my questions and, and comments build on a combination of the reports and information submitted to date, uh, as well as some of the concerns that were raised at the previous open house that I'm seeking uh, responses to how they've been addressed. Um, as I said, uh, avoiding the fact that the, the base synchro model doesn't appear to be fully validated um, and there's some issues with the trip generation numbers. Um, some of the, the, the more broad comments uh, that have been raised uh, are by uh, both the Public Works team uh, and by the region. Um, they reference uh, the setback of the parking from the North Service Road, um, particularly the, the difference between the vision as it was originally painted uh, and the site plan uh, for the interface between uh, the property uh, and the North Service Road. So I'd ask how that's going to be addressed. Um, equally, it was noted that the MTO had concerns over uh, access egress from the Casablanca interchange. Uh, again, there's no reference in the TIS to uh, anything to address this. Uh, so I'd ask that question. Um, the, uh, to put it simply, the ITE uh, trip generation manual um, in the most recent iteration uh, deals with modal split. Um, I noticed that you have identified 3% as non-vehicular uh, trip generation uh, and that the TIS actually referenced a multi-use trail uh, connecting across Casablanca. Um, my question to you would be, uh, how are you able to guarantee such a provision given that it's not within your property boundary? Um, so that's a question potentially for the planners. Um, The, uh, the other question in there is in, in the TIS is references the, the connection to the GO station. I'd ask how uh, this has been considered and reviewed in the TIS. A um, couple of uh, questions for uh, the internal site. Um, one of the questions raised at the previous uh, public house was regarding line of sight for the underground parking units. Um, I didn't see anything regarding how this had been addressed. Um, equally, there was concern over how the operation of the internal movements would work. Uh, if there was a clarification on how that would work, that would play into some of the concerns that exist at the moment about um, how the throat lengths for the access to and from the four uh, uh, exits to the site would work. Um, the TIS also recommends lowering the speed limit on the North Service Road, so I put that question to the planners. Uh, I didn't see any reference to that in the report from either Public Works or, uh, or the region. Um, and I think the, the other question, which was mentioned briefly uh, by a couple of residents in, in comments, was regarding site distance um, from the access egress uh, for the North Service Road. Uh, and I think that ties into the interface. Um, I think that's my questions for now. So if you need clarification on any of those, please, please ask me. Sorry. Did you catch all that? Um, I'll, I'll let you deal with yours, and then we'll have Mr. Basic speak to the speed limit. Thank you. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I will refrain from talking about synchro models and those types of things. And, uh, uh, but I do want to note that we've had a lot of discussion uh, from the original submission of the transportation impact study uh, and updated the study based on comments and meetings and discussions with uh, uh, staff and public works. So, I'm not quite sure on some of the comments because our understanding is that through those the updated study and through discussions that a number of the items have been addressed uh, with the updated site plan and consideration of the revised traffic study. So we can perhaps work with uh, planning staff as we move forward and clarify that. But uh, I would I believe a number of them uh, have been addressed. And just for example, the um, site access and the throat lengths and that associated with uh, connection of the north service road those did change from the original plan to the current plan as far as the uh, access separation 
uh, of the laneways from on Winston Road uh, to the North Service Road. So that was a change uh, with the overall site concept. Now, in context of what we're talking about this this evening and zoning and draft plan of subdivision, that is a lane that would be within a block and the further details would be addressed through the site plan. But those are certainly recommendations uh, that we've addressed in context of the site concept to illustrate that those those considerations and recommendations can be accommodated within what's being proposed in the blocks. Um, and again, the line of sight to the underground parking, uh, that also is something that we worked through uh, in discussion with uh, Public Works. There was, um, that was in context of the Winston Road entrance um, uh, to, to the west. And con there were uh, actually some conflicts identified with the entry, the laneway, and how we were proposing perpendicular parking. So we worked through that design uh, with the architect, uh, with the site plan, and the transportation consultant. And that's something that uh, we've worked through with the revised design and traffic study as well. So, and just as far as the modal split, I know we had some discussion with that uh, over time and how we are working in context with the Casablanca Boulevard EA as it relates to uh, future connections uh, to the GO, Go station and across the bridge. So uh, we were working within that context, but uh, I also believe that the modal split was something that was discussed and and uh, in the original report, we actually had a higher modal split based on the anticipation of the public transit and the GO station, and that was actually reduced uh, in the updated traffic study um, uh, for, for analysis. So I think we've done uh, um, a response to those, and perhaps we can clarify with staff, but uh, again, with regard to those items, uh, in the site design and the revisions, we I believe we've addressed them. And ultimately, those would be requirements that uh, would need to be addressed through draft plan conditions or the site plan review at, at the final design stage. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, if I can respond to that um, last point about any further review. Uh, both MTO and Public Works have provided comments to the Transportation Impact Study. Um, we're going to be working with those two agencies to to finalize everything before we bring our recommendation report forward. Yes, through you, Madam Chair, as uh, Member Stubbing noted, our um, the transportation impact study that was submitted did indicate something about reducing the speed limit on North Service Road. Um, we'll be discussing that with Public Works staff and and what the, the steps for that will be moving forward. Did you have any further questions, Member Stubbing, to that, or did you seek any further clarification? Uh, thank you. I, I think um, the, some of the discussions clearly that happened subsequent to the submit, submission of the revised TIS have um, answered some of that, but I do think it's important um, that we recognize there are a number, number of concerns uh, regarding uh, access, egress, and trip generation, um, and that in determining the uh, validity, uh, <coughs> that's not even a r real word, goodness, um, in, in, in determining whether this is an appropriate uh, uh, planning consideration uh, for this change. We need to have a bit more clarity on some of those, particularly um, the concerns of the MTO are, are quite quite concerning. Um, and it, to avoid getting too technical, queue lengths uh, onto the MTO, uh, back onto the QEW are not going to be acceptable to the MTO. And certainly some of the numbers suggest that may be an issue at present. <laughs> Councillor Sharp. I just have one more question. Uh, I guess this goes to the developer. Um, it's a, probably a two-part question. So what is the height of the building in meters? Uh, 
you, Madam Chair, I, I'm assuming you're meaning the 22-story building. It's 72 meters. 72 meters, the 22-story building. And what about the other buildings? And so I have a follow-up to that. So before we, is um, so in the past we have had a building that was approved at 18 stories and 67 meters that was later changed to 20 stories in 67 meters by changing the transfer slabs or the slab depths and transfer beams. Like, Anyways, they engineered the building a little different and they added two stories in the same height. So and with this development being there's more than one building, so if we approve for 72 meters, can all the buildings become 72 meters? And is there a way to determine the height of each building to, to prevent that? Thank you through you, Madam Chair. Um, that's something that we'll address specifically in our staff report. But uh, you can be as detailed as you want in, in, in a bylaw. You can, you can regulate by stories. You can regulate by physical height. Or a combination of the two. So that's something that uh, we'll address in more detail in the, in the staff recommendation report. So, so then, would that uh, limit the client or the um, applicant from from changing the designs once approved, if approved? Um, maybe if you, a, a question to you would be: What do you mean by change in the design? Height. If if you have a regulation of twenty two stories, then then you can't put in twenty three stories. If uh, if it's uh, seventy six meters or seventy two meters, then you can't go higher than seventy two meters. Or you can have a combination. You can say twenty two stories and seventy two meters. So maybe to clarify, can we regulate each building? Um, you, you, I, don't, I don't know how much it, it'll be. It'll be up to council also to finally approve or not approve something. Uh, we'll make a recommendation, but um, uh, we, we haven't formalized any final uh, our final review of the site. So uh, I'd like to reserve that comment. But we, you can uh, technically you can uh, you can nail down a very detailed design. Um, I'll, I'll just use Niagara Falls as an example. They, they even regulated step backs and all the way up for a 40-story building. And they had a very detailed zoning regulation that uh, uh, identified setbacks for each floor. So, um, so it's, you, can, you can technically get very, very detailed in a zoning bylaw, but there are, there are pros and cons to, to doing that. But that's something that we'll address in more detail in, in the uh, staff report. So my comment to that is that um, the applicant hasn't yet reached three times the lot area for um, for the density that's allowed there. And so there is an argument that would say that if the applicant were to make them all 22-story buildings in the same design as the first and second taller buildings, that it may not, that it may be deemed as good planning. And I don't want to see that happen. Uh, so is there any further questions of uh, committee? I'm going to just ask a couple. If so looking at the draft plan subdivision or the blocks, um, we're looking at two addresses, 362 and 368. I just wanted to ask if the, <coughs> um, the parcel that had the uh, residents on it that looks like it's going to be zoned O2, which also now has Winston Road going through it. Um, uh, it's in the top left corner of the, uh, um, of, it seems to be um, denoted as a separate parcel. I just wondered if those parcels are actually merged on title. Um, if we're looking at the full uh, two properties um, <coughs> inclusive, um, and um, that they just, it just, I thought that there, were, there was a restriction on, uh, maybe I'm not, but 
it's part of it is O2 and part of it's parkland dedication, but parkland dedication can't have a road on it. Just want to clarify that. Um, the, uh, the two parcels, uh, the parcel that had the uh, residence on it is currently vacant, uh, but it is part of the application. Uh, there is also a municipally owned, uh, road allowance, uh, that would, that was a continuation of Winston road, um, where currently there is a small parking lot for the park in that location. And then there's a North South which is a remnant of the old O'Field Road uh, road allowance. Um, so p part of this application is something that we'll uh, address through our uh, uh, staff uh, recommendation report is, uh, is how to address um, the exchange of land um, of the unopened road or the road allowances that are owned by the municipality and, and, uh, um, and how those would be integrated into the development uh, relative to and vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the dedication of parkland and the road allowances that are part of the development application. But we'll address that in more detail in the report. Currently, there are two separate parcels separated by a municipally owned land. Just missed the shadow study, so it, it there was only like four or five pages in the uh, documents provided on the town website of a shadow study. So I noticed in the pre-consultation documents that it wasn't included as a requirement. I'm just hopeful that because of the concerns about um, the uh, tower separation, <coughs> 25 meters and um, angular plane, however we're going to look at this, and to provide the most maximum sunlight to the green space areas and amenity areas that. Um, uh, that shadow study follow the proper terms of reference um, and that we do get a fulsome study back as part of the, the site plan review. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, that's, that's something that we'll be looking at in more detail when the site plan applications come forward and it's likely that we'll ask for shadow studies to determine impact on publicly owned parkland in the area. Can we ask for a wind study as well? Because it seems to come up the tall building guidelines in the second go secondary plan um, are a little more extensive about um, built form and, and stuff like that. Can we also request a wind study at this point in time? That's something that we'll look at when it comes forward. Yes. And uh, sorry, I'm going in pieces here. Um, so the water course um, is a, uh, I believe, an environmental protection area, not environmental conservation. The Lake uh, Ontario shoreline is, the, is a conservation area. So I didn't see in your report um, much reference to the actual water court, the environmental um, protection area, which is the water course. Sorry? Policies. Policy. I didn't see anything, any reference in your information report on it. Um, it were, seemed to refer to the environmental conservation area um, in calling it that. And I think it's just a bit of a clarification that that's not an ECA, it's an EPA. And the setbacks, um, just I'd like to see, and there was a lot of um, feedback when we're looking at view corridors and uh, the layout of the site, there was a lot of feedback from NPCA and um, other parties in the region as well about um, confusion with some of the reports about it still being referred to as a bioswale in some places and um, that it is critical that we keep that open as a natural vegetated buffer and part of the site line process through the site. I'd like to see that we don't interfere as much as possible with the setbacks from that vegetated and that, that uh, key um, it's a natural heritage feature water course through this site, although you might think it's not functional. It, it serves a purpose um, um, as it's coming down the escarpment, all the water's coming down there and it helps with all our water runoff and all that stuff. So I think it's going to be a pretty busy water course when we get into the spring. But um, I'd like to see that it, um, we, uh, I think right now what I'm reading the report is it's only a seven meter buffer and uh, minimum setbacks usually from these are, um, uh, 7.5 and it's an, and so I'm looking at a total of 14 meters I guess combined and um, I just I guess it's just a comment that I think when we go to looking at these blocks that we um, delineate clearly um, the the EPAs and the and the um, open space um, where it isn't encumbered by 
um, things that shouldn't be on it and it, it remains as a viable vegetated open space. It also, I'd like to see that we have enough of a setback from the, the, the developments and the buildings in the sense that when we leave something in a vegetated state, we get weeds and we get ticks and we get all those other neat things that come with natural environment. So just don't want to have somebody's um, like a direct walkway or a home directly. So just making sure that it's, um, um, it, we take into account separation from uh, other green areas or green spaces or walking areas that if it's a, a weed, weeded natural vegetated state that it's, uh, we take that into account. Um, so I think that was just, uh, just watching our parkland dedication separating and I think that one of the comments was ensuring that we mark the, the environmental conservation area where it's uh, delineated as well as the hazard overlay. I'm a little concerned about the um, the, how the hazard overlay was determined and the setbacks from the top of bank and those types of things with the 100 year flood and uh, some of the mapping but I'm hopeful that we can make sure that when we look at that and the peer review can ensure and the NPCA can ensure that we're not building a trail right next to the shoreline that's going to have the wind rush and the wave, wave rush come up um, as it is at the lake house development um, which the municipality then incurs the responsibility for maintaining that trail and right now we have serious issues with it being built a little bit too close um, to the revetment and as a result we have um, a lot of issues with regards to wave rush so i'd like to see that the considerations from and when we're looking at this from a planning perspective, that when we look at those setbacks and we take into consideration MPCA, that we also take into consideration our own needs from a municipality for the long range forecast, that um, we're not gonna be putting a waterfront trail or a nice promenade down there um, in a situation where we're gonna end up having to um, maintain or replace um, anything, that, uh, infrastructure that's on there. So just um, parts of these blocks, I think as we come forward with the recommendation that we ensure that they're just clearly delineated and, and the town is um, uh, thinking of those things. The other thing about employment overlay, a lot of the, um, uh, a lot of the concerns was about uh, how do we market this and how do we get um, uh, the employment, we need to get employment into Grimsby, we need to promote as much as we can additional um, tax base from employment lands. I understand that the developer and the applicant is trying to do the best they can with the property that's been given to them, but one of the recommendations from the peer review was that um, one of those buildings or a portion of those buildings be replaced with a class A office building and it be dedicated to employment uses which was the intent of the overlay and the intent of the uh, um, there was a, an actually a commercial review study done of the neighborhood and a lot of the allowances that were done when the Winston Road overlay was put in uh, which is different than the employment overlay by the service road um, and the different types of uses that were specifically referred to within uh, the master plan for the second for the Winston neighborhood um, that employment overlay in the peer review was also um, uh, noted that it's extremely important to the town that in some way we try to maintain as much of that um, uh, that dedication, not putting it in a mixed use building, that it be a standalone building. Now class A building, similar to the Aquazool Corporate Center, is a five story building. And to get a class A office building, a three story isn't a class A, a five story is. So I'm not sure how that can be, could be incorporated, it would be interesting to hear um, how we can bring and dedicate um, the employment uses we need in town in this particular area as the intent was within um, the documents on in, in the Winston Road neighborhood secondary plan and the commercial review and, and all the other uh, resulting uh, up to this date um, uh, studies. So I'd like to see if there's a way to still do that um, based on those recommendations. Um, There's a number of recommendations for holding provisions to phase it and stage it, and I know we'll get to that when we get to site plan, just so that some of the some of the uh, 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 priorities get uh, like our, maybe our our, rec, uh, our parkland and our rec trail get done first. Um, a few other provisions that, that um, uh, the noise one, which was another one, and I, I don't I didn't see it in here. If we need to have a, a perimeter wall, it talked about, and I don't see the development providing for any buffer from the service road, as in we have a noise wall further along the service road. So it, it talked about some uh, buffering, and, and I know that'll probably come out in site plan, as well as uh, noise attu uh, attenuation with regards to the building um, materials. So just would be interesting to hear if there is any other plan to um, put in a 
a noise wall along the QE or, or, or within, the, within the site itself to accommodate those noise, uh, noise concerns. Uh, there was some immediate mitigation measures that were put in the information report uh, that regional staff visited the site on April 5th and observed that um, re uh, remediation works had occurred on the creek. That's the water course I'm talking about. And they recommended that uh, the creek currently lacks vegetation and soils are exposed. Staff requests that the creek banks be stabilized with a native seed mix. just want to ask if that's been done. Through Madam Chair, uh, from what I understand, is um, the work that was done in that area related to the environmental work is in contact with the RSC? Okay, and the regional requests uh, have been addressed in context of uh, what has been identified in that letter. So it, it says that uh, staff requests that the creek banks be stabilized with the native seed mix and nurse crop or sufficient alternative as soon as possible to avoid any further degradation of fish habitat. So that's been done? We understand that it has been done during our uh, soils and salt gas. Our June <coughs> is salt gas. I'm just going to reiterate the, some of the uh, member Stubbing's concerns about traffic impacts and ingress and egress and queuing. Um, so even though the Casablanca, what I'm reading in some of these reports is even though the Casablanca EI addressed some um, of the, tra the challenges with regards to the traffic from this proposed development, I think there was still some um, uh, deficiencies that are put in this report with regards to um, the impacts on queuing and, 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 and back uh, uh, you know, lots of cars backed up, getting through to get and make their turns. So um, we're hearing that now. So I just hope that we just uh, we we seriously address that when we're looking at this um, uh, to get to get that mitigated. I'm almost done. I think I'm almost done. I know I talk on and I talk on and I talk on. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I, I really didn't have any other questions at this point. And pending no further questions from committee members, um, we're going to close this uh, public portion of the meeting. I'm going to thank everyone who attended and contributed their questions and uh, comments. And I'm going to uh, leave it open again that we're still here to hear more. So please feel free to. Uh, send those in, and I'm just going to pass a motion that uh, resolve that report PA 2001 regarding official plan amendment 26 OP 16 1805 zoning bylaw amendment 26 Z 16 1803 and draft plan of subdivision 26 T 16 1801 applications at 36 at 362 and 398 North Service Road be received, and that's uh, moved by. Okay. Who's, is that you, Member Stubbings? That's Mem oh, Mayor Jordan. Moved by Mayor Jordan, seconded by Member Stubbings. Um, uh, all in favor? It's carried. So uh, considering we've finished the, uh, the business for this evening, uh, again, if you want to stay around and ask questions, of uh, the applicant might be around for a bit, and planning staff, and we'll see you again, uh, hopefully, at another future meeting. Thank you. <laughs>